graders, Adelaide goes to West and Grace goes to North Middle School. So thank you ladies for being here. Serving as our guest panelists tonight are Flora Lee of the League of Women Voters of Sioux City, Woody Gottberg of the Greater Sioux City Press Club and KSCJ News, and Mary Hartnett of Siouxland Public Media. So thank you all for being here tonight. And on behalf of the citizens of Sioux City, I want to thank our candidates for their willingness to run for public office. On Tuesday, November 5th, one candidate will be elected to serve on the Sioux City Council and one to serve as mayor. The candidates for the City Council are Rhonda Capron and Julie Shaner. And the candidates for mayor are Maria Rundquist and Bob Scott. I will momentarily pose an initial question to the candidates relative to their qualifications and will allow them a 60 second response time. The panelists will then pose their questions. The first panelist will pose a question to all the candidates and after each of them answers, I will call upon the next panelist to pose the next question. I will rotate the order in which the candidates respond. The candidates will have a maximum of 60 seconds to respond to each question. The young ambassadors timers will show the sign to the candidates when 30 seconds remain. Would you hold that up now so they can see it? Thank you. And then they will hold up a second sign when time is up. So do you have a time up sign? There we go. Um, I will um, announce when the 60 seconds are up and we will proceed to the next question. During the last 10 minutes of the first part of this session, each candidate will be given a chance to ask a question of their opponent. At approximately 7.50, we will take a short break. The audience members are encouraged to write questions on note cards provided. And during the break, our Mayor's Youth Commission members and young ambassadors, with the assistance of the League of Women Voters Forum Committee, will collect all the questions posed by the audience. I will reconvene our forum after our break and pose as many of those questions uh, as possible. The final portion of the forum will last approximately 30 or 40 minutes. At the conclusion of the audience segment, each candidate will be allowed a 30 to 60 second summation. I would like to remind the audience candidates and panelists that we have an opportunity to model respect for ourselves and others and listening skills tonight uh, the same way that I ask my students to do every day. And we would ask that you all silence your cell phones. Thank you. I will now pose our introductory question to each candidate and you will each have 60 seconds to respond. Um, please state your qualifications for serving on the Sioux City Council uh, or as mayor. And we will start with uh, Ms. Uh, Capron. First of all, I want to thank the League of Women Voters for having this uh, event. It, um, is a, it's a good process for everybody to get to know who we all are. I've owned a small business for 40 years in Sioux City. I've been dedicated to Sioux City, and I love Sioux City. I've been on the council for eight years. Um, I'm qualified, I'm experienced, and I love what I do. Um, I, I work hard. We have a great council. We all work together, and that's how you get things done. So when you have somebody that, uh, that enjoys what they do, which, which I do for sure, um, it, makes it, it makes it more of a joy, and, and, and you, you can put yourself back into it. Um, so with that said, I, you know, I, I have integrity, I tell the truth, and if you ask me a question, I'll tell you the answer. And if you don't like the answer, then we can talk. Um, I'm transparent, I understand uh, that people are not always happy, and that's, I get it, you know, but that's what we're that's what we're here for. So if we can make things easier, or at least uh, come to a conclusion, um, that's what it's all about for me. Thank you, Ms. Um, now I'm going to say it wrong. <laughs> Shaner. <laughs> Shaner, thank you. Thanks for having me tonight too, as well. Um, I've owned my own business for eight years. I'm the owner operator of Soho Kitchen and Bar. Prior to Soho. Um, I spent 12 years as an operations manager for a large bank in Siouxland uh, with uh, managing a team of 70 plus employees. 
uh, after that, I own my own consulting firm with business and credit management for another three years. So I feel as though my financial background is going to do a lot of help for me in understanding the budget, um, where our money is being spent, and if it's being spent wisely. I've always been entrusted in a leadership role in every position that I've held in my career. I work both well as a team leader and as a team player. I respect the different opinions of others, and I'm willing to listen. Um, I lead quietly through my volunteerism in Siouxland. I support many 501c3s. I understand the importance of supporting them in our community. Um, I've served on many boards, CSADV. I serve on the board of downtown partners here in Sioux City. Um, I also serve on the board, <clears throat> excuse me, of 100 Women Plus, which serves 501c3s in Siouxland as well. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Ms. Runquist. So, yeah. Thank you to the League of Women Voters for hosting today's forum. It is my pleasure to be here to share my dreams, ambitions for our community. I will be humbly honored to be your next Sioux City Mayor. I guarantee that I will provide the leadership, integrity, accountability, and ethics so needed in our government. As you know, this is not my first time running for public office. I am a persistent person, a courageous person with lots of wisdom, a unifier, a leader, an advocate for the people and for our planet Earth. My qualifications, professional volunteering, my education in business, human resources, my experience as former educator, I'm an author, and my diverse history of civic involvement over the last 29 years equipped me to meet the needs of our community. Thank you. Mr. Scott. For the past eight years I've been your mayor, I've served as your mayor for 15 years, uh, I've served on the city council for 20 years, and in that time I've gained, I think, a lot of institutional knowledge which is helpful to the councils that served, have served with me. But that's not a good enough reason to vote for me. I've tried hard, especially the last eight years, to listen to people's concerns. I've tried to hard to balance a very limited budget that we have to try to do good things in our community. I've been a, the one of the council members been overseeing the economic development, and we've had some successes the past few years. And so I want to continue that success because I want opportunities for my grandkids. So just like when I served the last time, I wanted opportunities for my kids. Fortunately, some of them have stayed here, and I want to make sure that your grandkids have that opportunity as well. So thank you for allowing me to serve in the past, and I hope I can continue. Thank you. And we will now turn to our panelists to pose the questions. We will start with uh, Ms. Lee. And if you would direct your first question to Mrs. Shaner. Okay. My question is, um, what do you see as the greatest challenges facing the city, and how would you prioritize those? Number one greatest challenge for Sioux City, I believe, is funding, infrastructure, and repair. Um, we do have a budget. We do have a CIP plan for the next five years, but I think it's going to fall short of what we need to do. Um, I believe that we need to have a new plan that runs beside our current plan for perhaps larger projects to get kind of a scope of the big picture. Um, I think that all the stakeholders that work for the city should come together. We should form a panel and we should look at a decade long plan. And then once we figure out what we need, how long it's going to take to get it done, uh, then we have to find out what we're going to do for funding. But I think we need to let the citizens know what we're up against because that is one of the number one topics. Why isn't our tax dollars paying for infrastructure? Thank you. Uh, Mrs. Runquist, would you answer the same question, please? Yes, our city, my priority for the city challenges that we're facing right now is high taxes. 8% high taxes is really high for property taxes and also for the business. So we need to, when I get in, into the council, I will be more responsible in spending our funding and I'll be more with, and I will get those uh, monies direct 
to the city needs, like potholes, water quality, homeless, take care of the people who live in the city. Thank you. Mr. Scott? I don't think you can argue that our streets are in drastic need of repair. I wouldn't disagree with Julie, but we started two years ago. We designed and bid $3.6 million worth of asphalt this year. We haven't bid $1 million in the past, and a lot of that's due to the fact that we were spending a lot of money around our schools, and those are done now. We have a plan. Our, our engineering department already has about $7 million worth of projects engineered. I met with some contractors today to make sure they're able to do that type of work because we do need to catch up on potholes. I think our citizens deserve that. That's one of the major deals. But we cannot lose sight that even though we have a small working uh, a pool of workers right now, we still have to be doing economic development. Because if you don't do economic development, you go backwards, you don't go forward. And we can ill afford to do that. We've done it far too often in this community. We need to continue to work on economic development. So for me, there are two, two things in particular. Thank you. And Ms. Capron. Um, I'm going to go back to the, to the infrastructure also. Um, Julie's correct also, but she's also wrong. She wanted to do, you cannot do a second CIP. The state says you can't. And it's a, the state certifies our, our budget. So that's one thing. She had, she had mentioned before about doing a referendum. The state won't like that either. If you did do it, if it could be done, your taxes would go up. The bottom line is we don't want taxes going up and the, and the referendum uh, uh, costs at least $25,000 so, to have it done. So as far as the, the infrastructure goes, we have $30 million to $40 million for infrastructure. And as Bob said, we have $3.5 million for um, overlay. And we're working on all the... We're not picky here. Oh, I'm sorry. So we're working on, on everything that... that Julie is saying that, that we should do. So that's my, that's my issue. Thank you. And we will now move to our second panelist. Mr. Gottberg, if you would direct your question, please, to Mrs. Rehnquist. Thank you. Um, we've heard a lot in the past couple of years about riverfront development in Sioux City. There have been a variety of ideas from green space to even a Ferris wheel. Uh, with riverfront development, what would you like to see done and what would you like, what improvements would you like to see come down to where we used to have the casino boat? Yes. Uh, last night I attended a, a Court of Engineers meeting about the Missouri River runners, the sort of Missouri River, that air, they have the management and empowered over the Missouri River. Uh, we cannot afford more flats, and we cannot predict we having a flat or not having a flat. This is up to modern nature and climate change. So I am not in favor to develop riverfront. If we develop, we just put benches and a trail, but not a Ferris wheel. Okay, thank you. Mr. Scott? Well, I don't think any plan today shows a Ferris wheel. I want to clarify that. I think that probably is way behind us. I don't think anybody supported that uh, other than a few people. But, um, you know, I ran for the council eight years ago because in the 14 years that I left, they never built a trail, which is unacceptable to me. If we can't invest in that type of infrastructure in this community, we ought to get out of being in the city because we're not doing the things that citizens would like us to do. We've spent a lot of money on trails without raising your taxes, and, and we're seeing the benefit of those now. So I support the Riverfront Plan, and that's one of the reasons I'm running. I want to at least see that project begin so that next councils that they're more concerned about taxes, even though they don't want to invest in the future, at least have to continue that project because I think it's terribly important for the families of this community. Thank you. Ms. Capron? The riverfront is the jewel of Sioux City. When we get that, when we get it done, and I think it's gonna happen earlier than later, than later because we've had uh, uh, quite a bit of investment in it already. We, we've already raised, the fund raised 2.5 million bucks and, and they're gonna start working on it in spring of 2020. So if we can get that done sooner than later, that, that will be a, a big plus for Sioux City. Um, I believe that 
uh, it's, it's going to be a wonderful amenity for everybody, not for just one, t one person. There's going to be a dog park. There's, there's going to be a, a, a kid's um, play area. Uh, there's going to be a water, a water function in there that, that's going to be really cool. So, you know, the riverfront, it's, it's a big deal to me, too. I think it needs to be done. Thank you. And Ms. Shaner. I agree. I think the riverfront needs to be developed, but I like to see the riverfront have more of an attraction that actually would be a destination for people who come through rather than maybe driving by the interstate and looking over to say, oh, what's, what, what's down there? I'd rather see something large start in the beginning. Um, not a Ferris wheel, obviously. I think that that was just someone making a point to say something that you can see, something that makes people stop and get out of their cars. Um, I'd love to see something a little bit larger happen down there, uh, maybe a walking bridge, um, a dock, maybe a river boat, a tram across the river. I think that we could talk to South Sioux about a footbridge, which I know takes a lot of the budget, but when you have the most amount of money up front is when is the best time to put in a wow factor and then backfill with smaller things. And maybe we can get some funding from the private sector to put in a dog park and put in maybe our yoga stations and things like that. Thank you. Ms. Hartnett, would you direct your question to Mr. Scott, please? Okay. Well, it looks like the move to uh, remove the city's pit bull, pit bull ordinance will be back before the council in November. I wanted to ask, um, What's your take on that? There was a lot of discussion in the last few meetings about um, whether it's being fair to owners and also whether or not the city could be sued if, if that ordinance isn't uh, repealed. Somehow I knew that question would come up tonight, so I've been thinking about it anyway. I, I've, Ron, to con confirm this, I've been sending a lot of emails to the city attorney. I, listen, we, when they put that ordinance in effect, there wasn't such a thing as a service dog or an emotional support dog. So the laws have changed. We can't violate the ADA and we cannot violate the fair housing standards. We're not going to in this community. We haven't in the past. We're, we want to be fair. So anybody can probably go get a pit bull today and call it an emotional support dog and we're going to be unable to enforce that. So we need to strengthen our laws. We need to make a higher penalty for people that do have dogs that are vicious. We need to make the penalty for unneutered or the licensing fee for unneutered dogs higher than what it is because an unneutered dog is not as vicious as one that's been neutered. And so there are a lot of little things we're working on. Uh, I'm not sure the city attorney is going to get that done in two weeks. And I don't want, if we're going to do a dog ordinance in this community, let's do it all that first time, get it over with, and be done with it. And that's what we're working towards right now. Thank you. Okay. Ms. Capron. Well, I had to ditto that. Bob covered it all. Um, obviously, everyone knows out there that um, I think the ordinance needs to go, needs to go away. Um, and I've had people call me out on um, that I should abstain. I will not abstain. I don't have a reason to abstain. Just because I have a pit bull doesn't mean I need to. Um, and we have another issue also. Um, why should I have? I shouldn't have to abstain if Pete doesn't have to abstain because we're, we're, we're on both ends of it. And, and I respect Pete. You know, I've talked to him about it, and, and we understand each other. But if one abstains, the other has to abstain. And it's not going to happen. Thank you. Ms. Shaner. I believe this pit bull ban is going to be decided through litigation. That's going to drive the answer. I don't think it's going to come down to the opinion of the council. I think the city attorney is going to be deciding how the vote goes. I truly do. Thank you. Ms. Runquist. Safety is my priority, and, they, and the law that they have now is good, and I will amend the law. Keep the law for the pit bulls, no lifting, keep the ban with the amendment with the ADA requirements. I don't like litigation. And it's a waste of money for the taxpayers. If you make a law, it's a law. You don't undo a law. Just amend the requirements of the ADA. Thank you. And Ms. Lee, we are back to you, and you will direct your question to Mrs. Capron. Okay. 
There's been a great deal of conversation or comments about infrastructure, economic development. Um, and uh, my question to you is, how do you see the city growing economically? And also, how do we work towards um, fighting that uh, worker shortage that we have? Well, it's kind of twofold. Um, it first, is. Yeah. First of all, uh, of course, we want to, we have economic uh, development going strong right now in Sioux City. And we can attest to that just with a warrior, um, with the Badger building, building that we have, um, that we're working on right now. Uh, downtown, downtown entertainment, um, the Hard Rock. I, I mean, we're, we're getting bigger. So with that said, um, I believe that we have to keep doing what we're doing. Um, we have to invest in, in, in some of these um, uh, projects, just like we have it doing, so. Thank you. Ms. Shaner. I agree. We need to build, build, build. But we've got to have our community in the condition that someone wants to come here and live. We have to be a place where young people who go to school here, we've got colleges, but as soon as they graduate, they seem to move away. So we need to make our community a place that people want to live, um, a destination community with finishing these trails, finishing the riverfront. Um, we need to perhaps encourage businesses who are already here to expand, offer them some incentives. They obviously love our city. They're already doing business here. They're familiar with what they have here in town. So rather than always looking and waiting for someone from outside of our city to come and relocate here, perhaps we offer some incentives for businesses to expand and offer some new jobs. Thank you. Ms. Rehnquist. Economically, the city needs to, uh, to bring more technology, better jobs, uh, good paying jobs, good paying jobs. We're losing our professionals, our young people. They don't, we don't have the jobs for them. They go elsewhere. We have too much retail and pays minimum wage. They don't, you have to work two jobs just to make a living. And people don't really want to move here. We're losing people. We need better jobs. We need technology, data processing. I did in my, uh, why I, you bought for me? Because I can bring better jobs like Google and Facebook and Nordic Technologies in Sioux City. Thank you. Mr. Scott. You know, we built a r record number of apartments the last couple of years, and people say we're not growing. Our school district's up 350-some kids this year, so we are growing this community, rather, rather than people want to believe it or not. That's the reality. And, the way you solve the worker shortage is we solve the housing shortage in this community because we have to have places for people to come to live. And it's difficult to find a place to live in this community, even with all the additional apartments and houses that have been built. So it's a chicken and egg thing for me. But, you know, we've, we're working on economic development. Our staff calls on an average of 10 of the existing businesses every week to make sure that we're in tune with they, what they want to do. And we get that report and I make calls with it and it's other council members make call. We know that the internal growth has much more potential than the external growth. But we also know that if we're looking for external jobs right now, we have to do it with large capital investments and not a lot of employees because we cannot expect to put an additional burden on the employers that are here when there's already a tight labor force. So it, we're in a situation that's good to be in, but we need to continue to try to grow that labor force. Thank you. Mr. Gottberg, would you direct your question to Ms. Shaner, please? Thanks. The city hasn't been in the jail business since the old police station days back on uh, years ago when, when we had the station at 4th and Water Street. One of the proposals for a new county jail is to m maybe put it on the airport where the city does have some acres down in that area to be developed. Should the city be involved again in the jail business? Rather, it's 
property or, or partnering for a new jail. We obviously are, are going to need a new county jail soon, but what should Sioux City's role be in, in getting to that? Well, definitely take a, take a step back and really, really consider what the options are, the pros, the cons, where the funding is going to come um, from. I don't think we can take on much of the burden of the funding. Um, jails cost a lot of money to build. They cost a lot to maintain. So I think slowing down and taking our time to really make a decision um, and getting all stakeholders involved is probably the best way to, to look at it. Thank you. Mrs. Rehnquist. I am not in favor to build a county jail. Most of the people that are in the county jail packing is just for drug offenses. Misdemeanors or people that uh, they don't, they dare just for something that they can be uh, doing a rehab rather than being in jail. So I'm, I would not uh, put uh, taxpayers' money even in the city to build a county jail. Thank you. Mr. Scott. Well, first of all, let me say that the council that got us out of the jail business should be congratulated. They're probably the smartest council of all time. Second of all, we're in the jail business whether we like it or not because that ta we're paying 80 percent of that jail business already, so I don't know why we need to participate a whole lot more, but I've got trying to keep an open mind of what they're trying to do. I realize that the jail we have today is not in very good shape. I, I don't think our citizens want the jail to be in a, a situation where we're transporting prisoners 100 miles away because our jail is failing, air conditioning and heating and those sort of things. But it's, a, it's going to be a monumental task in this community to pass a $40 million bond issue. I think we, everybody should recognize that. And it, the deal has to work for the city because we don't need any ad additional burden when we're already paying the majority of the cost for the jail to begin with through our tax dollars. So, Thank you. And Mrs. Capron. Okay, so I'm not crazy about having a jail out by the airport. First of all, that means that our police department has to drive that far out there to drop somebody off, and they have to drive all the way back. They, they almost have to go out of service because it, it, it's going to take that long. And by the time they get there, get them booked in, get them back out, you don't have enough police on, on the uh, uh, working on the street. So that's number one for me. Um, I, I also feel like Bob does that it's a lot of money. And I, I, I'm sorry, it's it's a lot of money. And and I think that we could. We, we need to sit down and talk to the county and, and come, come to a conclusion. So um, obviously we do need jails, you know? That's just a, a, a sorry, sorry thing for, for all of us, but you know, you gotta take care of the people that, that we have out there too. So um, with that said, I'd, I'd be sitting down for negotiations, I would think, with the county. Thank you. And moving to our next uh, question, uh, Ms. Hartnett, would you direct it to Ms. Runquist, please? Oh, okay. Um, not too long ago, there was a lot of discussion on the council about a possible change in the noise ordinance, and people were concerned, people living downtown, doing business downtown, because of all the festivals and the events and what would constitute uh, too much noise and who could be charged in that case. And in the event, I don't think anything was ever decided and it was sort of sent back for more discussion. Do you think this is the kind of thing the council should be looking at and sort of taking into consideration because we want people to, to live downtown, we want people to feel comfortable, but we also wanna have activities. It's kind of hard to, to balance. <coughs> Uh, yes, I think that we have an ordinance about that. It is 11.30 p.m., uh, the cutoff. Uh, I know uh, some people get uh, past the 11.30 p.m. I have people in my neighborhood that pass until midnight. So, but um, we should, um, we have at 11.30 p.m. If they pass the time, they should be fine. Thank and you. this is, it has to, uh, mm -hmm. uh, wherever you live, if you live in the downtown, uh, you chose, you're gonna have noise. 
If you don't want the noise, uh, move out uh, in the suburbs. Thank you. Mr. Scott. You know, it's a balancing act. I think our staff has uh, figured out that we don't probably need to change the no noise ordinance. We just need to be equal in how we treat the time. And that was a problem that some could go longer and some could not go as long. And so I think they've got the message from the council and the neighbors and the community that we need to balance that. And since that's happened, we haven't had the complaints. And I, I think people downtown understand that they're gonna have festivals. They don't necessarily have to like it. But if we can't say we're gonna have an entertainment district and not allow some of those festivals, I sometimes think we have more than we need, but I don't go downtown like Mr. Waters does. I stay at home at night. <laughs> And my neighbors don't have wild parties like yours, so I'm, I'm not as affected as others. But, but I, think, I think we have struck a balance because we had a lot less complaints as the summer went along than what we had early, so. Thank you. Ms. Capron. Well, first of all, it's 1.30, not 11.30. Um, I think that the business owners have, have become very responsible. Uh, the Hard Rock has. Um, most everybody seems to be, you know, cutting their... Um, their, uh, their party's off at, at midnight, if not, be, if not sooner. So with that said, I can't see why we need to change a noise, a noise ordinance if it's, if it's already working. Um, when I had my bar, 1.30 was fine, and I, I, didn't have, I didn't have anybody around me, so it, it was all fine. But um, we haven't had complaints, and so if, if there's any more <coughs> complaints, I guess we'd have to look at it. But as far as I'm concerned, it's, it's good where it's at. Thank you. And Ms. Shaner. I agree with keeping it the way it is. Um, we don't really have that many festivals to complain about, I don't think. I'd like to see us have more in the entertainment area. Um, there's another layer to it that sometimes we forget about is that the actual outdoor festivals don't always start until 10 o'clock. So if we cut it off at 11, it pretty much limits it. Um, people who live downtown, especially in that entertainment corridor, um, they should expect that there's going to be noise, you know, every once in a while. It's not every weekend by any means. Um, one more layer to that is a lot of times these festivals benefit a charity. So if we have to end festivals, you know, it's going to affect more than just one person. It affects vendors, it affects businesses, it affects charities. So there's more to it than just a little inconvenience to noise. Thank you. Moving on to our next question. Ms. Lee, would you direct your question to Mr. Scott? At one time, the school district, the county, and the city all met to discuss certain issues that impact taxpayers and the community. Um, that, I think, has not happened for quite a while. Are you in favor of the, um, getting those three entities together and to discuss issues and how to best benefit the, the citizens of Sioux City? Well, back in the 90s, we did that. I don't know if they've done it since then, Flora. The problem is... We do share some resources, by the way. The, the city will push snow where the county would maybe be going. We, we trade streets in that area. I've always argued that, tell me the difference between mowing a park and a school park, uh, a school grounds. Why, why do we put a mo send a mower to a park and they drive by a school and the school goes by a park to mow a school? Why can't we trade acres to mow? And I mean, I'd be willing to talk about it again, but I talked about that in the 90s, and we could never get a consensus as to how that would work. There is very few things we can share. We do share it with the county, the computer system, and that you'll find there's not a lot as much to share as what you hoped there was. But we, if we can't solve how we mow and how we can trade that, I don't know how we ever move on to bigger issues. And... You know, we shouldn't be building a swimming pool, because, uh, an indoor swimming pool, because we have them in the schools. We had to figure out how we can work with the school district and that. But I would be in favor of that if the others would want to talk about it. Thank you. And Ms. Capron. Well, again, I have to agree with Bob. Um, nothing's better than sitting down and, and having a conversation, and I think that, that that's where you have to start. Um, with that said, I'd be, I'd be open to doing that, so... Uh, maybe that's something that we should talk about at council. Thank you. Ms. Shaner? I agree as well. I think we need to come together as a community. Um, county, city, the school board, everyone needs to come together. We don't have the same people on these boards that were there back in the 90s. 
And I think maybe right now we've got some people that are ready to step up and come together and come to some agreements with working and sharing, cost sharing, job sharing. Um, there's no reason we can't work together. There's just no reason. Thank you. And Ms. Rehnquist. I recall I did attend the school, dis school district, the county and the city here in these chambers. Passed, it was uh, in April when, um, and the assessor, the assessor's office were here um, and they discuss, uh, they have that meeting. I'm the only one attending. I don't know if it's open to the public or not, but I was here. And I recall um, they discussed about the taxes, uh, why they haven't done it every year. Um, the assessor was retiring, and I recall that the position of the assessors was open. I don't know if he got fired because he didn't do his job. That's what we're paying the taxes. This time, very high, because he did not do the values as every two years that he's supposed to do. Anyway, yes, I do agree that we should meet the three bodies every month. Thank you. And on to our next question. Mr. Gottberg, would you direct your question to Ms. Capron, please? Thanks. Um, it's been a crazy year for unprecedented flooding across the region, and I'm going to go back to talk about the river a little bit again. Uh, Christy Noem, the governor of South Dakota, told me this week at the Tri-State Governors Conference, we don't have any more room to store water, and we're going to have a winter snowpack and spring rain next year. With the budget year s starting as soon as uh, the, the new council is put in place for the first of the year, when you go through that budget process, should there be any type of look at spending money for more prevention efforts like the boat club has to take their docks out, those have been flooded away, there's areas of Riverside, there's Hamilton Boulevard, uh, down near the river that, that goes underwater. Is, is there something that the city can, done, can do or prepare for that we haven't done in the past to deal with flooding, which we may face again next spring? Boy, that's a good question. Well, I tell you what, I, I think that with all that said, I think we probably need to talk to Kelly Bach and some of our, um, our field people and see what they could tell us about what they could do to, to be proactive instead of reactive. So that'd be one thing. I'd, I'd wanna talk to the Corps of Engineers and see what they have to say. Um, it, it sounds like the 500 year flood could, could happen again next year, the way they're talking. So, um, and, and with uh, Governor Gnomes was talking and you know, how you can't control nature. So, you, you know, we're gonna have to come up with some, some, kind, of, uh, some kind of ideas to do something. Thank you. Ms. Shaner? I think too that we have to be proactive, um, sit down with our engineers here in town. Um, I think part of this has to do with climate change. Um, there's just nowhere for the water to go, as Christine Noem did say, but we've gotta sit down, perhaps talk about some kind of a temporary or even a permanent levy that maybe could be built along there. Um, but it, it's a discussion that needs to be had sooner or than later. Thank you. Ms. Rehnquist? Uh, yes, I did see the maps uh, of the Court of Engineers that we are expecting um, flood in the spring. We have, Montana is already uh, expecting that, and so is North and South Dakota. Uh, they don't know where to put this water. They'll fill all the reservoirs. So uh, I will um, leave the river be a river and put aside money for any emergencies, for levies or for bringing uh, work, workers to to deal with the flooding. But yes, we will have flooding. So 
It's not going to be a Ferris wheel, Bob. <laughs> Thank you. And Mr. Scott. Well, I don't know that anybody can pr predict how much snow and w rain we're going to have in that reservoir. No, nobody's that good of a, of a predictor. But I do know that there was a lot of water there last year, and they let it flow at only about 45,000. And had they let it flow at 80,000 like they're doing now, it's not flooding. So the way to solve the problem is to insist that the Corps for a year run that at 80,000 feet until those reservoirs, and if they do that all winter, the chances of a, of a, of a big backup up, up north goes down dramatically. I, did, I had to be at another meeting yesterday. The Corps was in town, and I would have liked to have heard what their thoughts are, what their releases are going to be, and Kelly will get that for us. But, I, you know, I think the Corps needs to step up. They know when there's snow. My God, we had it in Montana already. So keep that 8,000 feet all winter, or at least until we begin to get ice jams causing more flooding. And, and I think we can work through this without, you know, we, we had a lot of water here in this, and we only had Hamilton Boulevard for a couple of days. So it's not as, it's not the sky is falling in here that we have to go spend millions of dollars right now. Thank you. And Ms. Hartnett, looking at the time, this will be our last question from our panel. So we okay. could please direct your question to Ms. Shaner. Well, it, you have your business downtown. It seems like we've pretty much doubled the, the hotel capacity and the parking capacity and everything is really expanded down there. Uh, at, you know, before the, the hotel started being built, people said, well, do we need to have the, the need for the hotels first and the parking first? Or, you know, is it, you know, if we build it, then they will come. People will come here for conferences and events. Um, what do you think? Because it does seem like there's a lot more availability of parking at this point than a need. But do, do, you, do you think that that could possibly change? Well, I think the hotel was necessary. Um, a lot of our conferences require that we have an attached hotel to the event center uh, for transportation, for safety, for many other reasons. Uh, the hotel that was currently attached, as we all know, is done. So I think that it really tied our hands for marketing our event center. And now with the facelift that we've given the center, with the new hotel, I can only see a positive for everyone in the area. And not just historic 4th Street, but these people come on gas in buses. They come, you know, in minivans and things. So they're filling up on gas. They're stopping at quick stops. They're going out to lunch. They're taking tours. So it's not just historic 4th Street. It benefits the whole city. Thank you. Ms. Renquist. Well, um, I was in, uh, in favor of building the Marriott because we lost a lot of parking, especially to the uh, movie theater. Uh, we have enough uh, beds in this town that we're going to be hard to fill it out. Uh, we, we're going to have a, lots of competitions with other hotels. Um, and I also the Tyson Center and the Convention Center. The Convention Center is losing money. We don't have any venues there, and now being the Marriott, so they're going to have all the businesses. Maybe, but I, it's going to be a long, long time when we see um, downtown very busy and a full Marriott. Thank you. Can you repeat the question, please? I mean, we've got all the, you know, the new hotel going to be finished. We've got the new parking ramps. Um, and I think before they were built, people said, well, you know, it's a question of, you know, if we build it, they will come. Or do we have to have the need for it before we build it? I remember that conversation and on the council a few times. What do you think? Well, you know, I, I vote, I'll be very open. I voted against the Marriott because I had concerns about parking. Now, convention, when I go to a convention, I park in ramps. I mean, that's what you do. But citizens don't necessarily like to park in ramps. So that's, that is a concern of mine. I, listen, I'm rooting for them. I want them to be successful. I'm not, I hope that nobody thinks I want them to fail. And, you know, there's plenty of parking in the ramp to the west, uh, north of the older hotel. I, bigger concern for me when it comes to parking is if we fill that Badger building up with housing, which I think we will, then we have a real problem because the ramp to the south is already full, so we'll have to make some plans of how we're going to address that. But um, listen, I think the downtown is on the verge of being 
what we want it to be, a lot of people, a lot of action. And I've listened, I grew up in this town, and there's never been as much stuff going on in our downtown as there is right now. And you ought to be happy because we're not tearing stuff down. We're actually saving old buildings, which I think is a credit to the developers that have come into this community. Thank you. And to you, Ms. Capron. Okay. <laughs> well, here we go. We have to be proactive and, and look ahead. And when the Marriott came up for to build, when we were looking at plans, I thought it was a great deal. Two years ago, I went to, went to have lunch at Soho, and, and Julie sat down and talked to me, and she was upset about that. She did not want to have the Marriott built down there because of the parking. And all I could think of was, why wouldn't you? Because you, you have people that are, you have conventions that are going to be there on, you know, during the week, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. What better, better way to get business? Um, and they're going to walk just as far from the Marriott as they would being in the parking lot. So that, you know, that, that was my scratch there. I couldn't figure that out. But um, I'm glad to see that she's, you know, came up with, the, you know, that she likes it now. But, you know. No, I wasn't against the Marriott. I was against the footprint. I wanted the hotel to be pushed back away from the street to save a little frontage. And if you remember, I wanted the parking to be put underground that I thought would be a better design so that we could save some surface parking. Well, you didn't say that. Yes, I did. Okay, let's go ahead and move on to our next part, which is where you get to ask each other some questions because it looks like you have a few. But we're going to start with our mayoral candidate. So, Ms. Runquist, we will allow you to ask uh, Mr. Scott a question. Mr. Scott, do you think the property owners are a blank check because we have a problem in City Hall by expanding and expending money, taxpayers' money, faster than the rest of the state. Well, that's not necessarily true if you check the budgets, Maria. And if you, if you really have paid attention to budget hearings in this community, any council member that sits with me will confirm this. I offer more cuts in the budget than anybody else, and I'm not being critical of the council I serve with, I love serving with them. But I look at every item in that budget, and I ask more questions than anybody else, because I think that's one of the responsibilities I have, is to try to limit the amount of taxes that this community collects. And we've cut the levy more than we've raised the levy in the eight years I've been here. So to say that I haven't been concerned about that is just something you're not paying attention to, I'm sorry. And Mr. Scott, we will give you a chance to ask a question of Ms. Runquist now. Maria, in the paper you stated that you will raise the minimum wage, so I have a twofold question. Number one, how will you do that when the state legislature doesn't allow it? They passed a law that specifically makes it impossible for us to do it. And if you could, what would you, what would you want the minimum wage in this community to be? Uh, I would like the minimum wage 15 an hour. And I want a person that could persuade the legislature to raise, to raise the minimum wage, and it, not just to municipalities, to the whole state of Iowa. It has been done in other states, and uh, I can work with both parties. Um, I have done it before, and it can be done. Okay, thank you. All right, ladies, we're down to you. So, um, Ms. Shaner, would you like to ask the first question? Sure. Um, I'd like to know what your plan is for affordable housing and how we can include our um, disabled people in that as well. Well, first of all, I think Habitat for Humanity would be a good, a good start. Um, if you give somebody responsibility, responsibility for a house that they are going to put their time and ener energy into, I think that's going to be a big deal. Um, we also have, I got it wrote down here, we also have, um, let's see, oh gosh, well, anyway, it doesn't matter here. So affordable housing is a big deal for all of us, and, and we understand that. What I want to know is what is affordable? Um, we have people that, that need places to live, but they don't have any money. We need to find developers that will help uh, uh, put them in there in, in a housing. And 
so we need to work with them also. So with that said, um, uh, there's a lot of things that need, need to be done for sure. Thank you. And would you like to ask a question of Ms. Shaner now, please? Yeah. Um, back a couple of years ago, Harley Nights was a big issue for you. Mm -hmm. And actually it was two years in a row. Um, I remember you came down and uh, so did Ems and so did the Biker Knights and you were upset with them. You came to council and you wanted, you wanted our help. And so I volunteered to be a, a middle person, a negotiator for you. And um, everything was fine, you guys left that day. And then I get a, a letter saying, no thank you, I don't need your help. So the, my, I guess my question is, why were you there in the first place? Biker Nice is, is not a Sioux City event, so why are we involved if, if you didn't want to even take our help? Um, it wasn't the help uh, that we were passing on, it was the mediation that you offered. We wanted to discuss it with the uh, bikers ourselves and with Angel, which was what we did. So it wasn't that we weren't asking the council to help, it was that we were declining your personal invitation to mediate it for us. Why'd you come then? We came to council, not to you, personally. You didn't even come up and talk. Okay, thank you ladies. <laughs> we are now going to <laughs> conclude this proportion of our forum this evening. I would ask the audience to join me in applauding the Siouxland Public <laughs> your help tonight. Um, we will have an approximate 10 minute break at this time. Audience members, you are uh, asked to please write down your questions on the cards that we have provided and they uh, submit them to either the Mayor's Youth Commission or the Young Ambassadors or a League of Women Voters member so that we can ask as many as possible when we reconvene at 8 o'clock. Thank you.
Thank you. Okay, so you, your first point of hand up is that you have one minute? Yeah, yeah then, then, and then the 32nd, and then the time's up. I thought yes. we'd have to use this more. I was about to, yeah. I was determined a little at the uh, beginning, but, yeah. yeah. I think we're yeah. over there. Yeah. It was a little yeah. low. But she got louder, which is yeah. good. Yeah. Yeah. She, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and I don't know if her mic is working real well. I went down and adjusted it. We could take our seats, please, so that we could uh, get started. The sooner we get back to this, the more questions I can ask. Thank you. Pick it up some more. Go after me. You didn't think I did that. I don't think there's any internet here. Our break is now concluded, and I believe I have all the questions from the audiences. If not, hold your cards up so that we can get them up here so that I will try. I've got quite a stack. I will ask as many of them as I can get through. Please take your seats, and we will begin our final portion of tonight's forum. I would ask that you continue to keep your cell phones on silent and uh, demonstrate good listening skills to show respect for our candidates and for the other members of the audience. So um, 
I'm going to go through these. We're going to start off with this one because I thought that this was a really nice positive question to start with. <laughs> and I believe we'll, we'll start with Mayor Scott for this one. What one thing are you most proud of about our community? Oh, I think there's a lot of things to be proud about our community. I think the one thing that I brag to other mayors when we have meetings, I'm part of a coalition of the largest cities, and I'm also on the League of Cities Board of Directors. The one thing that I brag most on about this community is the willingness of the people to come together when we have a project and to accomplish great things. You don't have libraries, you don't have museums, you don't have art centers, you don't have a lot of facilities in other communities where the public sector comes together with the government in a partnership to make those things happen. In our community, for the 30 years that I've been around city government off and on, has shown time and time again how compassionate they are for this community, how much willing they're to give to make it better. So for me, that, that gives me a lot of pride, not because I'm the driving force, but because we have citizens like that in this community. Thank you. Ms. Rehnquist, same question. Can you repeat the question? Yes, please? what one thing are you most proud of about our community? The most proud that I heard the, uh, first of all, I came here 29 years ago. My husband is from Iowa and he brought me to Sioux City because uh, he wanted the kids to go to good schools. And the most proud that I saw in this community is the music. They had a Suzuki program in elementary school. And that is so proud because we musical family. And, and that's the reason, family and music. And uh, now we don't have that in the schools in the elementary level. Thank you. Ms. Shaner, same question. I'm very proud about our citizens, too. Um, I've been quoted as saying Sioux City is urban. We have 80 plus thousand people. But wherever you go, you run into someone who says, oh, hi, Julie. Hi, Mrs. Soho. You know, things like that. And I really like that balance, and I'm really proud of it. Um, one thing that's near and dear to me is our local food bank. And I keep saying, we're in the Midwest. No one should be hungry. And we've got around 20,000 plus food insecure people in Siouxland, but we keep our pantries stocked. It's never run totally out of food. We've got 16 pantries for people to come and get food. We've got our gospel mission. We have a lot of resources to take care of one another, and I'm very proud of that. Thank you. And Ms. Capron. No. I'm proud of our citizens because I tell you, if it wasn't for our citizens, we, yeah, we wouldn't be where we are today. And we have a great council that, that can push through things that, that they want. We have great amenities in this city. Um, I love what I do. I, uh, I, can tell, I, I do one thing that I'm really proud of. I was asked by a federal judge, uh, Mark Bennett, to speak at a um, uh, ceremony for um, immigrants. That's the best thing that I've done because you really find out what diversity is and, and you find out what kind of people we have out there. And with that said, uh, he asked me two years ago and I'm still doing it every three months. So that's a big deal for me. I'm um, just getting to know our people and, and you know, that's how I got here in the first place. Someone came to ask me to run. So I am the people's choice and I, and I, I, I really embrace that. I appreciate it. Thank you. Um, this next question is from the Sioux City Historic Preservation Commission, and they would like to know if elected or reelected, if you will all continue to work with the Sioux City Historic Preservation um, Commission to move forward with the current downtown historic preservation district project. And we'll start with Ms. Rehnquist. Yes, I'm in favor of keeping and restoring uh, historic buildings. Yes, um, I love to see the Sioux City to come alive when it was 
way, way long time ago. So, and we have a few that uh, needs to be restored and, and coming to life. Uh, we have one, the warrior building, that, um, that it should be uh, very uh, alive and coming next year. So it's something that uh, I'm proud to see is a historic building coming to life. Thank you. Ms. Shaner. Yes, I would love to continue to work on that. Um, having these buildings downtown, they serve as a cultural interest. Um, walking tours come from the museum. People are very interested in the history of the buildings. I will tell you that I did a few cooking shows at IPTV in the last couple of years, and they came and did an expose on Soho and historic 4th Street. And we've had people come from Ankeny, from Des Moines, from all over Eastern and Central Iowa to say, I didn't even know you had a historic district until we saw that on IPTV. <laughs> so that's awesome. You know, if you have a district and we can get the word out a little bit more, um, be advocates of our own area in these buildings and the architecture, I, I think people will just continue to appreciate it. Thank you. Ms. Capron. You asked about the historical buildings, is that what you're saying? Yes, would you continue to work with the um, Sioux City Historical Preservation Commission on the downtown um, historic? Absolutely. Um, when Jim Jung was on the historical uh, uh, committee, he did a wonderful, awesome job. And, I, and I'll tell you what, we have Virginia Square now, which is a historic um, development. We have Warrior Davidson, which, which is a historic development. Now we have L Lamb Arts Regional Theater that, that's going to turn into a historic. It's already historic, but they're going to turn it into a, a theater. These are what makes Sioux City who they are, because we have good history here, and we have good people that, that, that want to take care of the history. Um, we're right on top of that, and I believe that any time that, that we can take care of our historic uh, buildings, that's what we need to do. Thank you. Mr. Scott, same question. Well, I think what they're really asking, I might be wrong, is there's a way to master plan the downtown and put specifics in as to how you do a historic district. And I've been supportive of that for the last eight years. Not not the council I'm sitting with, I won't speak for them, but not everybody's always been for that because you put some regulations in place that some people are not going to like, but we can make that plan so that people can exempt their building out if they so choose to. We shouldn't force that development on it. But what it does is it gives the, the developers that want to develop older buildings in our downtown a leg up when it comes to going for state and federal tax credits. We've already done the surveys on the building, which costs somewhere in the neighborhood of $20,000 a building. So we, if we had this plan in place, it makes it so much easier to cut through the bureaucratic tape at the next level. And that's why I support the plan, even if it means we allow buildings to exempt out of it. Thank you. Um, I have several questions here about the problem of homelessness in Sioux City. So um, we have everything from um, should we prioritize it in spending or is there something that needs to be done to make people feel safer in some of our public buildings where the homeless congregate? So to try and put that together in one great big huge question that you can answer in 60 seconds, what would be your plan for helping to uh, control and provide for our homeless population here in Sioux City? And we'll start with you, Ms. Shaner. Okay, yeah. thank you. Um, the homeless problem in Sioux City has ticked up a little. I think that we've seen an increase in panhandling on our median and on our busy corners. Um, I think we've seen some uh, small tent cities coming up here and there where there weren't any in the past. But um, what I'd like to see is Sioux City try a pilot program called Home First. Um, it's an inversion of our age-old policy of get yourself straightened out, get yourself cleaned up, and then we'll see if we can get you a voucher for a home. But if we think about that, there aren't very many people who are able to get drug rehab, get any kind of um, counseling for mental illness, um, those kinds of things on the street. You can't get clean and sober, you can't get healthy on the street. So I would like to see us try 
um, a small pilot program where we actually put the person in the house first, whether it be a dormitory type room, a studio apartment, Shessler Hall's got a really good setup where they've got a number of rooms that the women go and stay in. Oops, that was my time. <laughs> finish your sentence. You can started. finish your sentence. Thank you. And then we look at them and ask them and determine what their needs are. We give them an assessment once we put the home over their head. Thank you. Ms. Capron. Well, we're already doing it. Um, we have a home. It's called Welcome Home. It um, has seven homeless women, I believe. Um, one of our gals down at uh, City Hall at housing, she's in charge of it, Darlene. She's doing a wonderful job. She's had very, very good success. Um, and that's what they do. They take them in, they work with them, uh, try to give them skills and, uh, and then carry on from there. So uh, it's baby steps. Being homeless is, uh, it's not something that, that any of us would wanna go through. So yeah, we would like to help, but I think that, that we need other people come, um, uh, involved in it too, not just the city. I, I think we're looking at the county. I think we should do, do uh, Nebraska, South Dakota, and and uh, Iowa, all of us together. So um, because the homeless isn't just in Sioux City, it's everywhere. So and also we, w the other problem we have is that there's <coughs> federal vouchers out there that that people can bring in from like uh, California, from Chicago. They can come in and use that voucher for 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 a home. Thank you. Mr. Scott. Um, we just had a study session up, up about a half, more than a half of an afternoon on the homeless. You know, the, the real problem for me is some homeless are going to remain homeless because our state is doing a terrible job on mental health and, and drug and alcohol ratification, or uh, not ratification, but solving those sort of problems. We've quit investing in that human factor. And that drives a lot of people to homelessness, unfortunately. And the role of the cities in Iowa have never been to solve homeless. That's been a county function. It's been a state function. We're not New York City where you get homeless money from the state. But that doesn't mean we can not do anything. You know, I've asked the city staff, we don't have an ordinance that allows a tiny house in this, house, in this community. Isn't it better for someone to have a 300 square foot home and be off the street than have no home at all? And so we, we need to change our ordinances. We need to do some things that will make that more affordable. But it's a tough problem to deal with. And the, the city alone is not going to solve that problem. We're going to need help from the private sector and other governmental bodies. Thank you. Ms. Rehnquist? Yes. I have several ideas. The homeless, they want home. They want a home to be able for them to live and have some enthusiasm because they able, all these people, they are homeless, they are able. I will build a pass on city land and get on board public and private partnerships and get on board the contractors and build homes with solar roof. We have them and put them back to work because they want to belong to the community, but they need a home first. Thank you. They have several projects that we can adopt. The Utah, so Lake City, Utah, has a pilot project. We can do, uh, we can talk to them, and we can do that in Sioux City. Thank you. Uh, next question. Um, the legislature uh, recently totally revised Chapter 20. So where do you stand in support of union contracts, uh, collective bargaining, insurance, wages, et cetera? So down to you. I believe in collective bargaining. I believe in our unions. Um, for the state to take that away from the unions, was absolutely, it was disgusting. Every person out there should have to be able to sit down and negotiate. So we as a council made a resolution that said that we would sit down and negotiate in good faith. And that's the way it should be. I don't care who you are out there. We all deserve a shot at it, and, and, and we deserve to sit down and be able to talk. 
So we, I definitely believe in collective bargaining and our unions. Thank you. Mr. Scott? I know this will shock some people. The recent poll that just came out, 61% of the people in this country support unions today. That number is up dramatically because I think people see some injustice in our society because of some of these state laws. People have bargained in good faith for many years. And to just come in and say that this council and this city staff can rip up a contract is totally unacceptable to me. We need to be fair to our employees. Our employees are out there on the front lines every day pushing snow and, and taking care of your streets and those sort of things. And I don't think, any other problem I have is they exempted police and fire. And that creates two classes of employees for me, which is not fair. It, the people that pick up your, your garbage in the parks are just as important to this community as police and fire. And I don't mean that because police and fire are not important, they're very important, but so are the other employees. And to, to not be able to have the right to bargain for basic health insurance and those sort of things is wrong. And so we've been very careful to try to not take advantage of that law. And, and I hope we will continue to do that out of fairness to all of our employees. Thank you. Ms. Rehnquist. Uh, yes, I, one thing that I agree with you, Bob. Yes. Well, that's good to know one. <laughs> <laughs> I thought we were going to make the whole night. <laughs> Yes, I support <laughs> collective bargaining. Yes, I support collective bargaining. Thank you. Ms. Shaner. Same thing. I, am, I support collective bargaining. I think that everyone has a right to stand up for what they believe in, to negotiate salaries, uh, benefits, and I think it should be for everyone. I don't think anyone should be excluded. Thank you. And, oh, you're going to love this one. Swimming pools. <laughs> with the decision to close the neighborhood swimming pools, has the city considered partnering with Four Seasons, the Y, or the city schools to sponsor a program to teach our kids how to swim? So. Well, we met with the Parks Board yesterday, and that was a topic that came up with swimming, and I, I think we need to continue to try to work with the schools, as I said earlier on that. The reality is we cut a hundred and some thousand dollars worth of subsidy out of the swimming pools this year because the pools that we closed just did not get the attendance that they needed to be successful. And the splash pads that everyone told us would never be used are being used in great numbers. So I think the decision that this council made was the right decision. Now, do we need another aquatic park somewhere in this community? Yes, we do. But until we solve some of the the pothole problems and those sort of things, it's going to be on the back burner, unfortunately. But, but we do need another aquatic center on the other side of town. And we'll get there. It may take a little longer than some people want. But, but uh, you know, recreational activities for kids are terribly important for this whole council. I can, that's the one thing I can tell you that we're, we're tuned into. So, Thank you. Ms. Van Quist? Uh, yes, I support... Uh... Four Seasons, uh, swimming uh, lessons for uh, being done at Four Seasons and uh, Sulan Y. And, and I know uh, it's not going to be paid by tax money. How can I going to be paid? Well, I will find uh, funds, uh, private partnerships to sponsor children um, for swimming lessons. But yes, they do need swimming lessons all year round. Thank you. Ms. Shaner. I agree with keeping what swimming pools we have. Um, I don't want to see any more removed. I am a proponent that swimming is a life skill. Uh, the younger you can learn, the better you are at it. I have grandkids. My kids learn to swim. They actually took lessons through the Red Cross sponsored them. So teaming up with some of the nonprofits here in town that offer those kinds of things I think would be a great idea, but I, I want to keep the pools that we have. Thank you. Ms. Capron. The swim, I, we went through a lot going through the swim pool deal. Okay. I, I didn't write the question. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah I know. Um, okay, so here's the deal with the swimming pools. Uh, they weren't getting used, and they're over 40 years old, and they were, they were, there was too much uh, money that we would have to put it back into them to have them to have them up to date, for one thing. The other thing is uh, uh, the ones that, that we got rid of, 
was uh, okay <laughs> i keep watching her <laughs> okay so the the ones that we got rid of we needed to get rid of leaf erickson we thought was going to going to probably go, you know, like maybe next year or two, but it sounds like it, it has uh, settled and it, it's, it's looking better. So, so that's a good thing. Um, kids want to be entertained nowadays. The swimming pool is not entertaining these kids. So the splash pads are, and we have five, five splash pads, which um, are, are doing very, very well. The kids are loving it, and so are the parents. Thank you. Ms. Runquist, who has been your elected official role model and why? You can't say uh, me after all you've said. <laughs> <laughs> well, I tell you, I don't have an uh, elected official role model, and I'm fighting for all, I'm fighting corruption from the elected official, from the top down. I'm a fighter for corruption. Thank you. Ms. Shainer, do you have an elected official role model and why? I have a local one, and his name is Alex Waters. I think he left. Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think that he's an inspiration to everyone in the community, young and old, um, disabled, non-disabled. Um, he gets out, he gets around, he listens. He's just an inspiration to everyone, and I appreciate having him on city council. Thank you. Ms. Capron. It's hard nowadays to have a, a special um, politician that you look up to, the way things are going right now. Um, my special politician would have been my dad. So um, he had respect, integrity, a handshake was his honor, um, and that's who I would look up to. Thank you. Mayor Scott? I'll date myself, and a lot of you young people won't remember these two guys, but. When I was a young guy, I got elected to the council when I was 35, I think, at that time. Well, I was 34. But anyway, uh, two, two guys that I didn't always agree with, especially being brash as I was back then, thank God I had grandkids, but were Lauren Callender and Connie Bodine because they, they took the time to get to know me. They took the time to tell me what it would be like to be a council member. I remember the best advice I ever got was from Connie Bodine. He's, when I got stupid one meeting, he said, you know, you got to remember you got to be back here next Monday and you got to have two votes to get anything done that you want to get done. And so those two guys, I, you know, didn't have to mentor me, but they did, and I appreciate that. Thank you. Ms. Shaner, what are your plans to bring more diversity of professional blue collar jobs into Sioux City, not just uh, the packing plants? Well, I don't think it has to be only blue collar jobs. I know Sioux City's kind of known as a blue collar town, um, but yeah, I can understand the packing plant seems to be uh, fulfilled with uh, Seaboard Foods and we have um, Global Foods downtown too in that area. I would like to see a little more white collar come to town in perhaps an insurance call center. You know, we could probably take advantage of some of the fiber optics that have been put in through the Badger Roll building already. And uh, those jobs are generally a little higher paying. I know that Des Moines is the insurance call sec sec center mecca, and I would love to see some of those jobs come this way. Thank you. Ms. Capron. Say that again. What are your plans to bring more diversity of professional blue-collar jobs, not just packing plants? Well, I tell you, I, um, like I said before, I, I speak at the immigration ceremony, and these people are here for a reason, and they worked hard to get where they're, where they're at now. So with that said, they're, they are already here in Sioux City, and I think just treating them with respect, making sure that they, they get what they need, and, and keeping, them, keeping them here it, is a good start. Um, it, it, it has to do with housing, it has to do with um, uh, different types of jobs that, that we can get them. So with that said, we just have to work harder at it. Thank you. I think some people have a perception that's all we go after are food processing jobs. I'm not going to apologize for going after those jobs because if we have 2,100 of them here in this community that we, we didn't have three years ago. 
and I, when somebody got on me about another packing house, I said, if I told you we were going to put 360 professional people to work in this community, you would, you would think I was the greatest mayor that ever served. But when I add you put 1,800 packing house workers, all of a sudden, that's a problem. To me, it's not a problem. Right. We need to recognize we have 360 office workers in that plant that are making way above average wage. Tyson in this community has a lot of packing house workers, but they have a lot of high paying executives in this community. So we should never shy away from those type of jobs. But every day we work on them. But your success in economic development is worse than the, the Mendoza line in baseball. You're not, you're not going to get everybody you want. We've tried to get computer centers here, and we'll continue to do that because that's what we should do because we should have a diversity of jobs, and we do that every week, and we'll continue to do that. But it's a difficult job, I can tell you, to, to get those type of jobs, especially with the labor shortage right now. Thank you. Ms. Rundquist? Uh, yes. I stated in my um, article in the journal, I would like to build more computer centers like uh, uh, Facebook, like Google, technical jobs. Uh, I, will, I will not bring another packing plant. It's enough, it's enough. They polluting our water. We have too much nutrients in our water. So, that uh, those jobs, yes, I agree with you. They pay really good. Uh, they pay in eighteen dollars an hour, and uh, I did ESL in Tyson uh, as an instructor, English as a second language, and I toured the plant. Those jobs are really hard. It's just uh, working with a knife is the hardest job that they can have. Um, and they pay in jobs, they could pay in jobs, $18 an hour, and they work two shifts. That is good money for the family. Thank you. But You're going to love this one. How do you work with someone you don't agree with? <laughs> You're looking at me? You're it's your turn. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's a very good question, because if I believe in something, I fight for it. But I walk away with respect and integrity. And, I, and if anybody watches the city council, they know that we all do the same thing. Because it's all about getting along. And, and we have to make our decisions. And there are, most of the time, it's opinion decisions. And if you can't get along, and if you can't agree or disagree on things, you shouldn't be up here. So I am a positive person, so I'm, I'm telling you, if we agree to disagree on something, at the end of the day, we can talk about it. Hey, it's okay. That's why you have five different people. Thank you. Mr. Scott. Well, I think there isn't a council member here, Rhonda, Pete, Alex was here earlier that didn't, because of the lesson I learned from Connie Bodine was that I write them an email and I say, congratulations on your election. And remember, we can disagree, but we cannot be disagreeable. That does not serve the citizens of this community very well. And, and so we need to have, and I try to do that with the audience too. I got, people didn't like it Monday, but we're not going to allow people be, to be disrespectful because a person has a different opinion. It's not acceptable. It happens way too often at the national level. We're neighbors, and we ought to treat each other like we're neighbors. And I think this council, uh, you know, we, we just don't have big disagreements. We may disagree on an issue, but when we leave that night, it's forgotten for me, and I think it is for every one of them. I've never had somebody chew me out the next day, so I appreciate that type of counsel. It doesn't happen very often in this day and age. Thank you. Ms. Runquist. Uh, yes, I'm a calm person. I, when I do a decision, I do research. I do <clears throat> ask for help. <clears throat> I do um, other sources that to be, um, to make a good decision. Um, and I like people. I would know, uh, be, I disagree and I respect their opinions, but this is that we are, that's why we are here, to do the best for the community. Um, do I have more time? Yeah, 20 seconds left. 20 seconds, yeah. And I, I recall when I sent an email to one council, like a 
Mayor Bob Scott, I sent him an email. And uh, he didn't like it, and he sent me uh, back very harsh uh, with accusations in that email. Do I need to go to a lawyer and sue you? No. Do I need? No. I just ignore it. Thank you. Mayor Scott, I think this is a follow-up for something that was asked. Did they answer that? Uh, uh, no. Do I get to answer that? <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Ms. Shaner, I apologize. That's okay. Go ahead. Uh, I respect differing, differing opinions from others. I respect their ideas. In fact, some of my best ideas came from other people. Um, I know how to turn the page every day. I work in the restaurant industry. Someone's always calling in sick, going home early, breaking something, burning something, ordering the wrong thing, and you can't let those kinds of things get to you. It's all in the day's work. You finish that shift, you finish that day, you turn the page, and the next day you start fresh and you go at it again. So I don't have a problem with working with people. Um, again, some of my best ideas were someone else's ideas that I hadn't thought of. Thank you, and I apologize again. That's okay. <laughs> now we'll go back to Mayor Scott. No. I think this is a follow-up for something that was said. Rhonda. Oh, well, Rhonda's turn? Yeah. <laughs> okay, it's <laughs> Sorry. time for me. Oh, <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> That's a nice point now there, Bob. Oh, yeah. thank you. This is why you're the mayor and I'm not, right? No. Okay. Where's that gavel? I have it. Yeah. Okay. This this is a follow-up, and I think and I think I was thinking of you because I think it was something that you said. We were talk you were talking earlier about job sharing with the county and the schools so that we could get the lawns mowed and not double up on efforts. If you were going to go to some kind of job sharing among the county, the city, and the school district which employees would get cut? I don't know that any necessary. Well, no, no, we're nope. going okay. to let her go first. Okay. <laughs> well, go ahead, Bob. <laughs> <laughs> How about it? I'm not sure. You know, I, I think we need to sit down and discuss it because, you know, you know we probably, the city has more, more employees than what the, the county and, and uh, school district would have, I'm assuming, and, and uh, it's a city project that we're talking about here, whatever has to be done. So I think that, that we'd have to sit down and discuss it. I'm not sure that, that it would work, but you know, you don't know unless you try it. So now it's your <laughs> Well, I don't know that anybody gets cut, but does it make sense at 238 a gallon to drive by places, just the gas savings and, and the maintenance on the equipment and the time to get there? Would, could be dramatically reduced. We share purchasing. There are other things we share. It's not, I think the citizens think that we don't share anything. We do. We, we share, they buy their gas from our, our fuel. I think we work on some of their equipment for the county. We work on like certs, the vans and that. We have a lot of sharing agreements that we do. But uh, I, I don't know that anybody necessarily has to lose their job, but can we become more efficient? Because sometimes our parks look like they aren't mowed enough, in my opinion. Sometimes our cemeteries look like they're not mowed enough, in my opinion. So if we somehow cut the travel time out and put that actually mowing the grass, for instance, would that not make the citizens more happy, even if it costs the same? To me, it would. It, it, it's important that we look like a well-groomed community. So. Ms. Rundquist? Uh, what was the question? The question is, if um, there was a job sharing program between the county, city, and school districts, which employees would get cut? I like the idea of those job sharing. Yes. Um, I will do a, a research and I will be, yeah, which, uh, but yes, if something needs to be cut, I'll cut it. Okay, thank you. Ms. Shaner? Um, I don't think jobs need to be cut. I think the point that was made earlier is to do things more efficiently and maybe save some money um, in the long run. So, you know, again, if we're mowing over here, but the mower's kept on this side of town, well, let's let the county do that one and we'll sit down together and work out some kind of a plan, you know, where we're working more efficiently. And if each one of us end up with a little more money in our pocket, great. We can clean up something else or spend the money you know, on something that works just as well. But I don't, I don't think it's a matter of cutting an employee and saving money. It's doing a better job at what we're doing and doing it much more efficiently. And there's no reason we can't work together. We all live here together. Thank you. All right, now is it your turn? 
did you answer that one, Rhonda? Yeah, she okay. started that. Sorry. One. Yeah, she said. <laughs> All right, go ahead. I don't know whose turn it is. You're in charge. <laughs> That's a bad idea. <laughs> Okay, this one has to do with our designation as a tree city. Um, there seems to be a disconnect between that and the fact that we can't take care of the newly planted trees and keep cutting down mature trees. So can you talk to us about the trees? Well, I don't think you're a tree city. We've been a tree city for a long time and that means we plant a lot of trees to stay ahead uh, if we're the city got out of the tree trimming business we don't trim trees so if they're cutting trees down it's homeowners that we don't really have any control over the city only has one tree crew and it's basically designated to trim around stop signs and those sort of things so I can tell you the city does not have the budget to go out and trim a lot of trees. That's just not happening at the city level. So I guess I don't understand the question as well as I should. I'm sorry. Okay. Thank you. What do you feel about being a tree city and caring for the trees, Ms. Rundquist? Oh, yes. I'm a tree person, a tree hugger. <laughs> yes, I would like to see more trees. Um, Beautification in the city with not just trees, with um, native uh, plants and that uh, and yes we have cut a lot of trees um, to make parking or I was appalled to see North High School got cut so many trees but uh, I have no control of that but I we should be planting tree uh, harbor tree celebration is coming soon I think in the spring, and we should have a group or a celebration, and everybody should plant a tree. Thank you. Ms. Shaner? Uh, we do have a little tree care going on in Sioux City, uh, downtown partners. We have someone coming around. They water the trees. I don't think that they're pruning great big trees, and it's a financial burden to do that, but they're trimming them to keep them off the wires, to keep people safe. Um, so there is tree care going on. Um, there are a few trees missing here or there because of wind damage or something like that in some of the smaller uh, planters downtown. But Downtown Partners is addressing it, and I think there may be some leftover trees this fall that we're able to acquire and fill in some of the, the blank spots. Ms. Capron? Well, first of all, a lot of, our, a lot of our trees are 80 years and older in the city. So, yes, we have to, we have to keep planting. Um, Arbor Day, like... Uh, Marie said it's coming and, and uh, Kelly Bach is in charge of our trees and so that that happens every year. So with that said, um, we do need to have trees trimmed. A lot of times the trees are the tree limbs are hanging on on branch or on um, on lines and and they need to be taken care of. So and like Bob said, we only have we have one crew. So um, we can't do it all. <coughs> Sometimes the, the homeowners will do it themselves, which is a big help for us. And, you know, the, the thing is, is, you know, the city can't do everything. Sometimes we need help. And uh, I'm, I'm all for that. I do it myself at my, at my house. So, you know, we can be good stewards of our city and, and make sure that things are looking nice. That's what it's all about. Thank you. This next question is going um, to uh, Mrs. Runquist and Mrs. Shaner. Um, our city is considered one of the poorest in regards to property tax compared to others in the state. How do you plan to sustain our prop property tax dependent entities while at the same time lowering taxes? So Ms. Shaner, would you like to answer that first? I don't plan on lowering taxes because I don't think we can go backwards. Um, if we try to lower taxes, the city's going to suffer. Um, we need to keep steady and we need to find new revenue but I don't plan on lowering taxes. I'm not a proponent of that. I'm not a proponent of raising, but I, we can't go backwards. Thank you. Ms. Runquist? Uh, yes. <clears throat> I belong to the Iowans for Task Relief, and there is a property tax reform bill uh, in the legislature, and it is uh, requires cities and counties to pass a resolution that identifies the maximum amount of property tax dollars they are going to collect 
in the next fiscal year and hold a public hearing on that resolution. Uh, yes, it will be a tax reform bill and we are gonna follow the state law. But they will, we will not, uh, they will have cap 2% that we cannot uh, go over. Thank you. This next question then goes to uh, Ms. Uh, Capron and uh, Mr. Scott. Can you explain how the Pierce Street contract was written without a clause concerning late completion and a daily fee if they were late? Uh, would you be in favor of writing future contracts in that manner? The Pierce Street happened before we decided to do what you just said. So that, that is now in contracts that um, if they get done early, they get a bonus. If they get done late, they get, they get charged. So that's it. I'm not sure okay. that's quite right, but there is a penalty clause on that particular contract. And the contractor told our city staff that he would put more crews on that job than he was able to do after they tore the street up, which was terribly unfortunate. And then we get blamed for the streets around the school that wasn't our contract, that was a school district contract. That's one of the nice things, you get punished for deeds you don't even do. But anyway, it's just reality. And, and we disrupted that neighbor, it's totally unacceptable. We should have not allowed the, the 23rd or 24th Street of Pier Street to be torn up at the same time until we had that intersection. And there will, there will be damages on that particular project. I have been a proponent like the highway department. You get a job done early, you get a bonus. Why not? If, the, if it opens up, you get a job done late, you pay a penalty. That's the way it should be. And we have a reluctance in our engineering department for some reason to pay bonuses for early completion. And I think that's the wrong approach. Thank you. Looking at our time. I'm going to ask one last question and then allow you each to have 60 seconds to uh, summarize why you should be elected. And then I have our closing statements. So our last question is, would you, use, using one word, compliment your opponent? Using one word. Yeah, so we'll, I'll just start, we'll just start here, one word. Well. Thankful, and I'll explain it in my closing remarks. <laughs> Go ahead. One word. One word to compliment your opponent. I just want to give him a hug. Aww. <laughs> yeah. I'm not a hugger, yeah. Maria. <laughs> this, is a, this is a stretch. <laughs> Ms. Shaner? Ambassador. A good business owner. Thank you. One word, isn't it? <laughs> and now we will allow you each to make your closing remarks. Um, let's just go straight down the line again. So, Mayor Scott. I do want to thank Maria. You know, uh, other people didn't have the courage to run this time, and I think she needs to be congratulated for that. She <coughs> stepped forward when others wouldn't, and I think I'm a better person when I'm challenged than when I'm not. So I'm thankful for that. I want to thank the League of Women Voters. You know, they're in the trenches in all these elections doing what they should be doing, trying to give candidates an opportunity to learn more about or to, to uh, talk about what they want to do, and they give citizens a chance to uh, know more about the candidates. So their work should be congratulated as well. I've been your mayor for eight years. It has been an honor and a pleasure beyond what you, any of you can imagine. This job is so rewarding to be able to work with citizens and try to solve their problems. So I would ask for another four years that I can continue to do that and would ask for your vote on November 5th. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Runquist. I believe everyone should be given equal opportunity, regardless of race, creed, religion, gender, age, national origin, disability, marital status, or sexual identity. I am myself a Mexican-American. As your leader, I will respect the background of all citizens and defend your rights to contribute to our community. Acceptance of diversity and respect make us all strong and united. Let's keep diversity and respect alive. My vision is that someday we will have a city council that represents 
more fully the fabric of our community. Choose the leaders that empower people, leaders that have the courage to fight corruption, leaders that fight for equality and justice. As your leader, I will put political and economical power back where it belongs with the people. Thank you. Ms. Shaner. I'd like to say thanks for the opportunity tonight, too. I know that you guys have uh, the best interest of, of the voters in mind when you ask us to come and sit. Um, as a community, we need to establish priorities and go to work. I am asking for your vote in City Council. I've never avoided hard work in the past, and I'm ready to work for you. I have visions. I have strong work ethics with my professional banking background, and if I add my innovation to that, I think I make a great leader. I, a plan backed by action becomes reality. I think we have a chance to make some changes. I know that they're going to take time. They're going to take steps. I don't think we're going to have leaps and bounds in 24 hours if I take a seat at this council, but I'm willing to take the time. I'm willing to invest. We have a chance to be better. We have a chance to change, and I would appreciate your vote and your support. Thank you. Last but not least. <laughs> Hello. Okay. I speak from my heart and I speak the truth. I have strong positive leadership. I've been on the council for eight years with experience with many things over that eight years. I've been a mayor pro tem. I've been a small business owner for 40 years. I have common sense and that means good government. I'm honest, I have integrity in all I do. I'm a listener and a communicator. I'm grassroots. My campaign donations have been from people who believe in me. Full disclosure, I have spent $100 of my own money to open up my Rhonda for Council checking account. So all the money that I've gotten have run from people that believe in me, and I, and I totally appreciate that. I'm here to make the hard decisions. I also, I'm also here to be the greeter at our city's doors. It's all, it's all about engaging with people, sending them home with good vibes, and they will come back feeling welcome. I love Sioux City, and I ask for your vote November 5th. Thank you. Let's give our candidate On behalf of the League of Women Voters of Sioux City, the Greater Sioux City Press Club, and Sioux Land Public Media, I want to thank our audience for attending tonight's forum. We appreciate your being here. And also, let us again thank the Mayor's Youth Commission and Young Ambassadors for their work tonight. Ladies, you did a great job. Thank you. We again thank the city for working with us to arrange for cable television and YouTube coverage of this event. Above all, we want to thank our candidates for their cooperation and commitment to public service. I would remind you that the Sioux City Community School Board, the Western Iowa Tech Community College School Board, as well as the City Council and mayoral elections will take place on Tuesday, November 5th with the precincts open from 7 a.m. to 8 p.m. A listing of your precinct is available from the County Commissioner of Elections at the Woodbury County website or at the Woodbury County Courthouse Room 103. There are two other methods to cast your ballot. You can fill out an absentee ballot request, which are available in the entry area. Those need to be mailed by tomorrow, so make sure you get it postmarked to the Woodbury County Commissioner of Elections, who will then send you a ballot to complete and return by mail. It must be postmarked by November 4th. You may also opt to vote early by casting an absentee ballot in person at the auditor's office in the Woodbury County Courthouse, room 103, during regular business hours, or you can plan to vote at your precinct on November 5th. If you have questions, call the Woodbury County Commissioner of Elections, Pat Gill, at 279-6465. Anyone who is 17 years old may register to vote in the first election in which they turn 18. So we have voter registration forms available at the information table. You may also register to vote at your precinct on election day, provided you bring acceptable ID, a driver's license, or photo ID that is current, valid, and contains an expiration date and has your current address. Should you wish to learn more about the League of Women Voters membership, uh, our focus is on nonpartisanship, 
voter member education on issues facing our nation, state, and city, please stop by the city, uh, the table on the way out, and you can pick up membership information. That's how I got here. <laughs> Uh, and then you can also mail us at P.O. Box 5091, uh, Sioux City 51101. Do remember to follow us on Facebook, League of Women Voters of Sioux City, and join us in 2020 to celebrate the 100th anniversary of the League of Women Voters founding and the passage of the 19th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution, which gave women the right to vote. Thank you for your participation this evening, and remember to vote in this and every election. Your vote is a precious gift. Use it wisely on Tuesday, November 5th. This concludes our candidate forum. Good job, ladies. Good job. Good job.